Amen. Amen. Thank you, choir, for that blessing. Amen. Well, I want to welcome you again, and thank you for worshiping the risen Lord with us today. Um, and now we're going to transition from worship through song, through worship, and hearing the Word of God. So let me pray for us one more time uh, as we begin. Lord, now uh, we acknowledge our need to hear from you. So, Lord, I do pray that you would help me speak. But far more than that, Lord, I pray that you would speak today. You would speak e personally to each of us. And you'd help us to understand your word. Help us to believe it. To apply it. Lord, to obey it, to know the joy that comes from walking with you. Pray that you would give us that this morning and every day as we seek to surrender and submit our lives to you, Lord. Give us the joy of obedience. So speak to us now, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, please turn to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Now, did you know that Christianity is the only religion in the world that believes in grace? It's true. It's what sets apart Christianity from every other religion and, in fact, every other worldview in general. For example, if you go to the Muslim, they will tell you that to be a faithful Muslim, you must uh, keep the five pillars of Islam and be faithful and say your prayers and give your alms and go on um, your pilgrimage. And, and you must do all these things. And even then, there's no guarantee that Allah will be merciful to you. You just don't know if you will or not. Buddhists, which is very interesting, uh, I, we, as part of a class, I visited a Buddhist temple one time in Auburn, Alabama, it exists, and they actually, Buddhists really, believe it or not, Buddhists are really kind of athe atheists, the, the, the more pure Buddhists are, they, they don't necessarily believe in a personal God at all, they just kind of believe in the cosmos, the universe, um, and you have to become one with the universe by extreme self-discipline. So you must rid yourself of every earthly desire, which might mean going to a monastery out in a, uh, in a mountain somewhere where you exercise uh, fasting and extreme asceticism. In other words, you have to be disciplined enough to attain oneness with the universe. Jews, of course, say that you must keep the law. Um, even Christian cults like Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses, besides their defective Christology or defective beliefs about the person of Christ, they also say that faith is, there's more than faith required. You must also do good works to be saved. And of course, uh, in, uh, in America, in the West, in, um, uh, in our secular humanism, uh, of course, everything is works-based salvation. You got to work hard enough. So you can get a good job. So you can be happy and live the American dream. It's all about work. Well, what does the Bible say about how we're right before God? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you have your Bible and you're able and willing, please stand. In honor of the reading of the Word of God, we're going to pick up where we left off last week in Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, 
so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet... We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. The word of God. You may be seated. We're going to see three things from our text today. Condemning hypocrisy, justifying faith, and nullifying grace. Condemning hypocrisy, justifying faith, and nullifying grace. Before we really get going here, I want us to, I want to review so that we can kind of keep track of what Paul is saying here. False teachers have entered into the churches of Galatia, which Paul planted in that Roman territory. And we call, oftentimes call these false teachers Judaizers. They were arguing that Paul's authority as an apostle was at best derivative from the other apostles and that he was peddling to the Gentiles a soft gospel of of Salvation by faith alone through, uh, in Christ alone. Salvation by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. In other words, the Judaizers were saying Paul was not preaching a true gospel of faith in Christ plus adherence to the Jewish law. But Paul, however, understands that if you add to the gospel, you lose the gospel altogether. To look to the law for salvation, to look to the law for salvation is to be lost because the law cannot save. It can only condemn you because nobody can measure up to the law. All the law does was to is to show you how far how far short you fall of God's perfect righteousness. And if you decide to stand before God on the last day and say, God, judge me by your law, you'll stand condemned because you won't make it. Therefore, we need to be saved, not by our own merit, which we could never earn, but by grace. That is undeserved favor by God, which we receive through faith in Jesus Christ. And when we believe in Christ, we, ac- we have access to God, not by our own righteousness, which doesn't exist, but through Christ's righteousness, because we receive it by grace as a gift. Now, Paul has to defend his authority to the Galatians against the attacks of the Judaizers. And so he defends the authority of his preaching and of his gospel message and its validity. And he defends, as we've talked about in the past couple of weeks, he defends his authority by saying that he did not receive what he preached, the gospel that he preached, he did not receive it from other men. Rather, he had a direct revelation from Jesus Christ in which he was gloriously converted and changed. His life totally changed when he met Jesus Christ. And he received his message from God himself through revelation. And he only visited Jerusalem twice within a 14 to 17 year period. And even so then he, he so he wasn't even close to the other apostles. He hardly knew them. But when he did go to the apostles and had a private meeting with them, which we talked about last week, 
when he did have a private meeting with him, they didn't add anything to his gospel. They didn't say that he was wrong. They didn't say he needed to add anything to his gospel. In fact, he brought a Gentile along with him named Titus, who was not a Jew, and they did not force Titus to be circumcised. And in fact, they extended to Paul and to Barnabas the right hand of fellowship and told them, you've been called to minister to the Gentiles. We've been called to minister to the Jews. And so they acknowledge his special commission. Well, in our text here, Paul gives one final kind of historical event to defend his authority. And he uses this event of the confrontation of Peter as a transition to get to the heart of the issue, to get to his theological argumentation on this issue. So first, we're going to see from this text condemning hypocrisy. Let me read verses 11 through 13 again. He says, When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So what's Paul doing? He's giving one more example of how his authority is not dependent on the other apostles. And this is probably his best example, because what did he do? He rebuked the apostle Peter. you got to have some gusto to rebuke the apostle Peter. But he did. At some point... Peter visited Antioch, which was Paul's home base of missions and the place where they sent Paul and Barnabas out on their missionary journeys. This is Antioch in Syria, which is a good deal north of Israel, outside of Israel uh, in Syria. And, um, and so he's vis- he's, Peter has visited Antioch, and it's most likely in between Paul's visit to Jerusalem, where they had the private meeting with the apostles, which we talked about last week. It's, it's most likely after that, but it's most likely before the meeting in Acts chapter 15, where they have the, the, the final meeting to deal with this issue about whether Gentiles have to become Jews before they can really become Christians. That, that happens in Acts 15, so it's probably in between those two events. So Peter is there. And apparently, Peter is enjoying table fellowship with the Gentiles. Okay? He's eating with the Gentiles. Now, you have to remember, in the Old Testament, Jews were forbidden from interacting in this way with Gentiles. And they they would not share a table with Gentiles because the Jews had strict dietary regulations. And if the food was not even prepared the correct way, they wouldn't even share, they wouldn't even eat food out of the same bowl. You know, if you're having a communal meal, they wouldn't do that in fear of that the food would be unclean. And so this is what, but Peter is apparently eating and most likely he's probably actually even eating unclean food, ceremonially unclean food with the Gentiles. Now, that shouldn't totally surprise us because who was the first person that God revealed the fact to that the Gentiles would now be accepted through Christ into God's people. It was Peter. Peter was on, in Joppa on the roof of the house of Simon the Tanner, and he had a vision of a sheet descending from heaven with all kinds of unclean animals on it, and God told Peter, rise, kill, and eat. And what did Peter say? He said, no, Lord, because I'm a Jew. I would never eat food like that. So Peter is hard-headed, all right? So God shows it to him two more times, all right? Now, I know there's nobody hard-headed in this room, but he had to show Peter three times that he was serious. And he told Peter that some people were going to come up to him, and he's going to share, he's going to share the gospel with the Gentiles. And then some people, a vis, an angel had already visited Cornelius up in Caesarea by the sea, and and uh, messengers knocked on the door and said, hey, we're from Cornelius' house. We want, he, an angel visited him, and we want to hear what you have to say. And Paul and Peter, who would have never entered the house of a Gentile, says, okay, I'll go. And he goes and he proclaims the gospel to Cornelius. And what happens? 
the Holy Spirit falls upon the Gentiles in the same exact way that he fell on the day of Pentecost. In other words, God is saying in an undeniable way that the Gentiles are now included in the people of God if they believe in Christ. That's what he's saying. And, but of course, this is highly problematic for the Jews since they've been God's chosen people for all this time. Peter goes back to Jerusalem and there's a group within the church of Jerusalem who is mad at Peter, grumbling at him saying he went to go and he ate with Gentiles. This is all in Acts chapter 10. But Peter said... What was I supposed to do? The Holy Spirit fell on them the same way that they fell on us, that he he fell on us. God is accepting the Gentiles. Are we going to go against what God is saying? And then they shut up. (laughs) But it's clear from what we're reading that that was not the end of the discussion. That didn't satisfy they, they had a lot of issues they had to work through before they were willing to see what God was doing in including the Gentiles in the people of God. And so that's Peter's background. Now Peter is in Antioch and he's eating with the Gentiles and then some people come from James who's back in Jerusalem. Now it's not clear who these people were exactly or if they're... It says that when they came... Peter separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. So it's not clear if the group from James is the circumcision party, or if part of that group represents the circumcision party, or if they had news back from Jerusalem about the circumcision party. It's not clear. But the point is, is that Peter, because these people came from James, he It brought about fear in Peter's heart of the circumcision party. Who is the circumcision party? Apparently, they were very conservative, perhaps Christians or maybe false Christians, it's not clear, who who believed that that, uh, you had to to keep the Jewish tradition or the Jewish law to be saved. They were very conservative about the Jewish law, even within Christianity. And so Paul, seeing these people, uh, Peter, seeing these people from James, withdraws from what he was doing. He withdraws from eating with the Gentiles. So what is Peter doing? He is acting one way around one group of folks, and then he acts a different way around a different group of folks. What do you call that? A hypocrite. And there are two things that make Peter's hypocrisy especially bad. Number one. Peter's hypocrisy told a lie about the gospel. Okay? He's eating with the Gentiles. In other words, you got in Middle Eastern cultures, even today, table fellowship is huge. To, 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 to fellowship at table with someone is to accept them. To, to withdraw from table fellowship from the Gentiles, Peter is, is, is he's saying without words. I can't accept you anymore. In other words, he, in, in, in essence, he's saying that because these, Christian, these Jews or whatever have come from Jerusalem, and Peter's saying, I made a mistake. You're not acceptable to me, and therefore you're not acceptable to God. He's telling a lie about the gospel with his actions. Not only that, but he, his hypocrisy does what it often does, and that is it led others astray. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, for goodness sakes, was led astray by Peter's hypocrisy and no longer ate with the Gentiles. So what do we learn from this passage? First, we must learn to beware of the dangers of hypocrisy. Peter, he was a disciple of Christ during Christ's earthly ministry. He's an apostle. This is, you know, well over a decade at least. After Christ ascended back into heaven, he's been walking with the Lord for a long time. And he plays the hypocrite. In other words, no one is uh, 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 invincible to the temptation of hypocrisy. And so whether you're a believer or not, you can play the role of the hypocrite. Now this is important um, because a lot of damage has been done to the church of Jesus Christ through hypocrisy. Now, there are those who who 
claim to be Christians and, and who play the hypocrite uh, as well. That brings a lot of damage to the church of Jesus Christ. Why? Because people who are not Christians, they tend to take your word for it. They don't understand that, that you can call yourself a Christian, not be a Christian. So people who are, lots of people who are, are, are unbelievers, they see people who say, well, I'm a Christian, but their life looks nothing like a Christian should look like. And they say, well, if that's what Christianity is like, I don't want anything to do with it. But how do you tell the difference between a Christian who has fallen into hypocrisy and an unbelieving hypocr- hypocrite? How do you tell the difference? Repentance. We have every expectation and understanding that when Paul rebuked Peter, he saw his error. And if our timing of it is correct, then in Acts chapter 15, when they finally hammered out the issue of the Gentiles, Peter was right there supporting it. In other words, Peter repented of his hypocrisy. If you're a believer and you're playing the hypocrite and someone calls you out on it, the Holy Spirit of God is going to convict you and you're going to repent. But if you claim to be a Christian and someone and you're not living like it and someone comes to you, you're going to say, well, who do you think you are to tell me how to live my life? But what you're, going, but what you're doing is you're telling a, a world out there by your actions, by your claim to be a Christian, that Christ doesn't matter. If you're going to lie about something, lie about somebody else besides Jesus. But don't lie about Christ. Don't say that you're a Christian and then live your life like Christ wouldn't make a difference if he was in you. Because he will. And Christ, and, and, and Peter, one of the worst things about his hypocrisy is that it led other people astray. Beware of this. People watch you. They are always watching you. And the way you live your life says something about the gospel. Says something about what you believe. And we, with our lives, have the profound ability to either lead people toward Christ or lead people away from him. And there is a special... Jesus understands that when we sin, it's not just you. There's no such thing as a sin that doesn't affect anybody else. We live in a world that is so individualistic that we think, well, we can, do, we can worry about ours and our own and our sin doesn't hurt anyone else. It always hurts somebody else. And when we sin, we're going to lead other people into sin also. Jesus said, if there is someone who causes one of these little ones to believe in me, who believe in me to sin, it is better that a millstone be tied around their neck and it be cast into the sea. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 13 through 15, Jesus said this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Beware of hypocrisy. And if you're if there is sin in your life, I I plead with you, repent. This is the Lord telling you right now, turn back, embrace the Lord with your life. And experience the blessing that comes with it. Next thing we learn from this passage is this. There is a need at times to rebuke others of sin. Paul opposed Peter to his face. That took a lot of courage. And I'm sure Paul didn't want to do it. And of course, there are people who all they want to do is confront other people. That's not the spirit of Christ either. But Paul Paul knew... That if he left Peter's hypocrisy unaddressed, it would lead to confusion among the Gentiles about what they must do to be saved. In other words, to not rebuke Peter publicly, in other words, Peter's sin was a public sin. And so so even if Paul wanted to address it privately, he, he he really didn't have that chance. 
He had to, he had to rebuke Peter, Peter publicly because it was a public sin and because other people, the Gentiles whom he had wounded and who he had confused as to what it means to be a Christian and to be saved, they needed to know the truth. And so he had to rebuke Peter publicly. Because Peter was telling a lie about the gospel. So at times, we will need to rebuke others of sin and we will need to be rebuked of sin. That's part of what it means to be part of a Christian community. That's why the local church is so important. That's why church membership is so important. That's why getting involved and being part of a small group and getting to know people deeply and intimately is so important because then you have people in your lives that know you well enough that can speak truth into your life. You don't want to be wandering around with some sin in your life that, that, that is hindering God's blessing from your life when, when that could be uh, easily helped if you just let people in to help to you, to help you and talk to you. But if you're always keeping people at arm's length and not letting them into your life and sharing them what's going on, you're denying yourself the blessing that God wants to give you. So you have to pursue and let people in and get involved. It's not just because that's what good Christians do. It's for your soul. It's for your eternal joy in the Lord. So first we see from this text condemning hypocrisy. Second, justifying faith. Justifying faith. faith. Verse 14 through 16. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So, Paul here, and I believe that this is a... These, I believe that this is what Paul said to Peter. This is, uh, I believe Paul's writing here what he actually said to Peter when he confronted him in Antioch. And he confronted Peter because his conduct, he says, was not in step with the truth of the gospel. That word there literally means to walk a straight line. He was not walking in a straight line with the gospel. His life was saying something different. And Paul calls him out on it. And he says, he says to, to Peter, how, if you were living like a Gentile with these Gentiles here, and the, then these other Jews show up from Jerusalem, how can you, though you live like a Gentile, force Gentiles to live like Jews? But that's what you're saying with your actions. And Paul says that he and Peter... He says, are not Gentile sinners. Um, He says in uh, verse 15, we are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul is saying, Paul is saying to Peter, we're Jews. We're not, we're not far off, so to speak, like the Gentiles were, which they, which they were. In other words, the Jews really did have the promises They had the covenant. They had the law. So the Jews had special privileges as the Jews that the Gentiles didn't have for some time. And Paul says, Paul says to Peter, we're Jews and not Gentile sinners. And then he says, but even we know that we can't be justified by the law, but by faith in Christ. Even we know that as Jews. So he says, So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith and not by works of the law. So he's saying even we as Jews, even though we have the law, we have the covenant, we have the promises, we know that we can't be justified by works. But by faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 16 there is the thesis 
of the whole book of Galatians. If you write in your Bible, I encourage you to underline it, put a star behind it, beside it, write thesis beside it. This is what this is Paul's point. This is the whole point of the book of Galatians. That we cannot be justified by works of the law, by what we do, but only by faith in Jesus Christ. The word justified is a legal term. It means a declaration of righteousness or a declaration of one's right standing before God. If you go to the courtroom and you have been accused of a crime, you want the judge to justify you. You want the judge to declare your righteousness with regards to the law. You want... You want the judge to declare you as in right standing with the judge. You want to be justified. But the question is, is our right standing before God based on what we do? Or is it based on faith in Christ? In other words, does God accept us decisively based on our works Or on what Christ has done for us. In other words, if you you think, this is so important. Because I'm telling you, so many people in the world believe with all their heart that because they can think of ten people worse than they are, that they are right with God. And you ask them, well, are you right before God? And they say, yeah, I'm a pretty good person. I'm telling you, so many people believe that. But the reason why is they don't understand, they don't understand the radical nature of sin. And what they have done is they have relativized their goodness. They think that God's standard of righteousness is a serial killer. Or Hitler. But why in the world do we think that God's standard of righteousness would be Hitler? We think that if we're better than Hitler, we're getting into heaven. But does God, is is our right standing before God depend on being better than the worst person you can think of? Isn't God's standard of righteousness this? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You must be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect? What makes us think that anything less than God's perfect righteousness will grant us standing before Him? And you say, well, Chad, nobody's perfect. Exactly! That's the point. But if you say that you're a good person, you don't understand. You've missed it. You're saying, God, accept me based on what I've done. And God says, you don't want me to do that. You misunderstand. If you rely on your goodness, you're looking decisively to yourself for salvation, and that will never save you. You will stand on the last day. If you say, I'm a good person, God will say, okay. You'll stand on the last day before the throne of God beside the bar of God's perfect righteousness, and you will fall infinitely short. But if through faith in Christ... You have been united with him by the Holy Spirit of God. You will stand before the throne of God on that day beside the bar of God's perfect righteousness. And then Christ will come up and say, step aside. And he will stand in your place. And he'll do monkey flips over the bar of righteousness. And then God will look to you and say, well done, good and faithful son. Why? Because you're righteous? No, but because Christ was your righteousness. No one, he says, can be justified by works of the law. You don't want to stand before God in your sin. I'm telling you. The Bible records many instances of people much more holier than anybody in this room who stood in the presence of an angel. 
just an angel who had been in the presence of God. And they fell down as though they were dead. You don't want to stand before God in your sin. But if you hide yourself in Christ, you have nothing to fear. For Christ is your righteousness. Don't don't look to yourself for salvation. Flee from yourself and run to Christ. Run to him now by faith. Turn away from yourself and look to Christ and believe in him and trust in him and give yourself wholly to him and he will hide you in himself on that day. Condemning hypocrisy, justifying faith. Finally, nullifying grace. Verse 17. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law. So that I might live to God. Now I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. This, is, this passage is a little difficult to explain, so we're going to have to take it verse by verse. Verse 17, Paul says, in our endeavor to be justified in, If in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners as Christ and the servant of sin. What is Paul saying? He's saying, he's saying, in seeking to be justified in Christ, he is acknowledging that he is a sinner. In other words, if you seek to be justified by the law, if you seek to be justified by what you do, what are you saying? You're saying that you think you're a good person. Think about it. If I, if I say that, if I, say, if I told you, my right standing before God is based on the good life that I've led, what, am I think, what, am I, what, do, I, what do I think? I'm thinking, well, I've led a pretty good life, Right? Otherwise, if I, I wouldn't say that if I knew that I was going to be condemned, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? I would not say I'm justified by God by my works if I thought my works were bad. I wouldn't say that. Paul acknowledging that he needs Christ is, a, is, the, is at the same time acknowledging that he can't be saved by works. But he says, if, if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners as Christ and his servant of sin. In other words, we're, in seeking to be justified in Christ, we're found to be sinners. Yes, I'm a sinner. But, he says, does that then mean Christ is a servant of sin? People still say this today. If you're saved not by works but by faith, then you can live your life however you want. Christ is serving sin. No! I preached a sermon on that a few weeks ago. I'm not going to preach it again, okay? Romans chapter 6. Look it up on the YouTube channel, okay? But is Christ... Is Christ a servant of sin? Paul says, no, he's not. He, Christ does not serve sin. And the answer there in Romans 6 is, because we, we die, we die to our sin, we're made new, so he doesn't serve sin. But Paul's point here in verse 18, he says, if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. In other words, Paul, in trusting in Christ, is, acknowledges that he is a sinner, but that does not mean Christ is a servant of sin. He says, actually, the opposite is true. Christ came to fulfill the law because you couldn't and to make our standing with God based on who he is and what he's done for us and not by our works, which can't save us. So in Christ, God is tearing down the law and bringing in faith. But the Judaizers, what were the Judaizers doing? They were trying to keep the law. As they're right standing before God. And Paul is telling them, if you rebuild what God is trying to tear down, you're the transgressor. You're the one that is against God's will. 
Because you're trying to keep what God is taking away. You're trying to justify yourself when only God can justify you through Christ. So Christ is not a servant of sin. Even though I'm a sinner and I need Christ as much as anyone else, it is you who are trying to rebuild what God is tearing down. And then verse 19, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. How do you escape from the law's penalty? Think about it. The law is good. Paul never says the law is bad. It just says he just says it can't save you. How do you escape the law's penalty? If you go into a courtroom and you broke the law and the judge said, oh, it's not a big deal. You can go home. What kind of judge is that? It means the law was worthless. It means it was no good. That's exactly not what God did. God doesn't sweep sin under the rug. How do you escape the penalty of the law? You give the law what it demands. What does the law demand? The wages of sin is death. How do you escape the law's penalty? You die to the law. How do you die to the law? Verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You see, how does Paul or anyone escape what the law demands is for the penalty of your sin? How do you escape it? You give it what it wants. You die in Christ. When you believe in Jesus Christ and yield your life to his lordship, the Bible says in that moment, your old self dies and your new self lives. And, on, and, it, and, it, and at that moment, it is as if when Christ died on that cross, you died with him. You, through Christ, the law gets what it demands. But in Christ, he's your substitute. And because he lives, you also will live. Paul says, I have died to the law because I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what it means to be a Christian. When, you, when we baptize people, that person is publicly testifying that their old self has died and their new self has been raised with Christ. If that is true, how can, you, how can we possibly ever live as if, as if we never died? As if our old self is still alive and well. But this is what Paul says. This is what it means to be a Christian. Our old self is dead. And Christ lives in us by the Spirit. He says, I live by faith in the Son of God who what? Who loved me and gave himself for me. What does that mean? It means that if Christ is in you, how are you going to live? You're going to love and give yourself for others as Christ did for you. That's what it means for Christ to live in you. Verse 21, Paul says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness was through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. There's a lot of people who don't understand what they are saying when they say, well, I'm a pretty good person. I'm going to get into heaven. If you can obtain the righteousness of God by your works, then why did Christ die? You see? If you can do it on your own, then why did Jesus come? If you can do it on your own, then why did Christ go to the cross? He says, if righteousness can come from the law, Christ died for no purpose. It was a big, cosmic, divine waste of time. But if, in fact... All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
and are desperately need of God's mercy and grace that they cannot attain on their own, but only by a gift, an undeserved gift that God extends to them through Christ, then it makes perfect sense why Jesus Christ came, why he died, why he rose again. Christ came because you do, in fact, fall short of the glory of God. You are, in fact, a high-handed rebel of God saying, every day, not thy will be done, but my will be done. But God, in his mercy, sent Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for your sins on the cross. And if you will yield your life to him through faith... You'll have the one thing that your heart longs for and you don't even know it. Peace with God and eternal life. That's the glory of grace. The glory of grace is that nobody's too far gone to be saved. The glory of grace is that it doesn't matter what you've done or how long and for how long you've done it, you can be saved. If you will yield. And bow the knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He will save you and he will change you. That's the gospel of grace. We're going to sing a song of invitation in just a moment. I'm going to be standing right here. If you want to talk to me about how you can receive Christ through faith, please come.